Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure again to be with you this Lord's Day evening. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 6. We're still working through chapter 6 from verses 10 through to 18. So that's a, Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end and with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let us pray, brothers and sisters. Father, we come before thy holy and righteous word this evening yet again, O Lord. And Father, I just want to pray, O Lord, that you would be glorified this evening in the preaching of your word. Father, I want to pray for this little flock here of your people. O Father, if there are any be here today who are under the condemnation of the enemy and they are in the dungeon of despair. Father, that you would use what is preached here this evening. O oh Lord, to release them and show them the light of Jesus Christ, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And Lord, if there be any here who have not yet called upon your name, Father, in your goodness, in your kindness, would this be the day of salvation, that we would see souls saved and clothed in the robe of righteousness of thy dear Son. Father, we love you and we glorify your holy name. We praise you for who you are, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Be magnified this evening. Edify your saints, but Lord Jesus, most of all, that you shall be glorified this evening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. This evening we will be continuing in, our great, in this great chapter in Ephesians 6. We will be picking up our study in spiritual warfare and looking into this great armour that God has provided for each believer who trusts in his son. Paul is, if you can remember, exhorting us as believers in the Lord Jesus to be ready and to stand fast in the Lord and in the power of of his might. He is encouraging us to take a stand against these principalities and powers and against this fiery fight with Satan and his demons, which will come to all who confess the name of Jesus Christ. Remember, just as Satan opposed our blessed Lord in the wilderness, in the desert, he will come to all his followers and try and oppose them who confess and bear his name. So Paul is saying we must be ready as individuals to take a stand and he tells us that God has provided us with an armour for this battle. And it is only by putting on this armour that we may be able to stand individually against this onslaught from the devil, whether that be is us as individuals or us corporately as a body of believers. 
And I don't need to go into this again, but we must be people, as I said last time and the time before, who take this battle seriously. We cannot be found to be those people who are ignorant regarding spiritual warfare. The devil will and is opposing every single person who claims the name of the Son of God. He has come against all those who confess and believe upon his name. So as I said, this cannot be something we put on what we call a back burner. Two weeks ago, if you remember, we looked into the first part of this armour, this girdle or belt of truth. And before we move on, I just want to give a very brief recap of what we looked at last time. We looked at how this great apostle here is using an illustration of a Roman soldier in describing this armour that God has equipped for us as believers. Paul, if you like, is using a picture that we may understand some understand something of the spiritual which is being described in this chapter. We said that the belt of truth which we are presented with is the first and foundation of this whole armour of God. We cannot go into what Paul has for us next if we are not clear on what this belt of truth is or if we as individuals do not gird ourselves with this belt remember as I said just as the Roman soldier needed this belt to be fixed upon him fixed upon him and his armor so all his loose garments are all intact so he's agile and ready for this battle we also must be girded with the truths of scripture so when the evil day comes and the evil day approaches we shall be ready to stand against the devil and his lies we looked at how if we are to stand fast, you remember me saying we must, we must be men and women who are rooted and grounded in the apostles doctrine. Scripture is and will always be for the Christian the foundation of our faith and its practice. If we are men and women who are ignorant of the truths of Scripture, therefore consequently shall be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, we shall be prime targets for the great enemy of our souls. Brethren, listen. Doctrine is essential. The word of the living and true God is essential. Why? Satan is the father of lies. And he will try and manipulate us and our understanding of who God is and the work that is being done through his son. So we become prime targets for his lies and his attack. As I said last time, we cannot be afford to be people in our day who try and bypass scripture and doctrine. Too many, as I said, and I say it again, and I will probably say it the next time I come up here in a few weeks. I think it's next week, actually. Too many have adopted the creed, I do not want doctrine, just give me Jesus. Or forget about doctrine. Just give me another experience. And that mentality, I have no apology, leads many people into complete ruin in our day. I say this to you, brothers and sisters. We do have experience, but the devil will soon come and sh shape you and any experience you may have. If you are not rooted in the truths of whom God is and not clear on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And as I said, God does give us those most glorious times of refreshment when he pours his love into our hearts. Yet we must not be people who are reliant on them. We must learn to be those who trust in his word when we have those most glorious truths and at the same time when we feel nothing. We must be rooted and grounded in the word of God. So when Satan comes with his attacks, we are girded with truth. And therefore, we, if we are not girded with these truths, we cannot rely on the one who there is no variation or shadow of turning.
We also looked very briefly at how even though Satan comes individually with his fiery darts and his accusations in this battle for truth, he also comes corporately, trying his best to sow in to a congregation false teaching. Many, I said, think that Satan is just in the business of shaking us with his fiery darts. And as I stated, he is the father of lies. He is also the inventor of the doctrines of devils and doctrines of demons. And as we said, we must be ready to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. As false teaching does not come as false teaching. And we looked very briefly at the example of the last pastor at Watchorn Church. A man who looked and acted like the real deal. But unfortunately believed a false view of God. Which if believed shall damn a soul to hell. Brothers and sisters, we came to the conclusion that false doctrine kills people. It sends them to an eternity in hell. So we, as a body of believers, must be girded with truth and stand on the truth that God has revealed through his word. So that is what we looked at last time. This week we will be moving on to the next piece of this spiritual armour which brings us to our text this evening and we are still in verse 14 of chapter 6. We read, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Then we're on this part. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So if you're taking notes, this leads me to my first heading this evening. The first heading simply is the breastplate of righteousness. As we have already stated, brothers and sisters, Paul is using a picture for us in this passage of a Roman soldier in battle attire. Remember, Paul was very accustomed to Roman soldiers in his day. Not only were they the occupiers of Judea, but remember, Paul was often chained to Roman soldiers. He, would have, he was under captivity. So this picture of a Roman soldier was at the very forefront of his mind. This breastplate that the Romans would have wore, it would have been sort of like a full body armour which protected all the individual's vital organs, such as the heart and the lungs. It protects the organs which are absolutely essential to human existence. Therefore, as Paul is using this analogy, we must come to the conclusion that this piece of armour is absolutely essential for our spiritual existence. But however, before we look at this next piece, I just want to reiterate something which I said two weeks ago. Unfortunately, some men, while trying to interpret this whole passage of scripture, have almost completely separated the armour of God from the finished work of Jesus Christ. Instead of it being the armour of God which he has provided for us, which we are to apply lie, some have suggested that this armour relies something on our own good work, something of our performance, something that we must do to kind of put this armour together. You may remember uh, when we dealt with the belt of truth, some had tried to say that this belt was nothing more than the Christian being a man who walks in his own integrity and someone who just tells the truth in all of his dealings. Brothers and sisters, as we remember, we are to be men and women who walk in our integrity and keep a good conscience before God and man. However, we saw how foolish it was to suggest that this armour in any way, shape or form relies on something that you and I do. Likewise, men again have tried to apply the same principle to the breastplate of righteousness. Unfortunately, they try and say that what Paul is referring to here is nothing more 
than our own righteous good deeds and our personal holiness. And somehow, our righteous good deeds and our personal holiness act as a breastplate for, and to keep us from certain accusations from the devil. Again, I have to say this, brothers and sisters, this is a most fatal error. It's fatal error. Please hear me. Please hear me. We are to pursue holiness. We are, as it says, to walk in the good deeds that God has ordained for every believer. If we are not pursuing holiness, we're not Christians. I'm not saying that we're not to do these things. But to say that this, this breastplate is our own righteousness and our deeds act as a breastplate against the enemy's attacks is totally absurd. Amen. Totally absurd. I must deal with this, brothers and sisters. I must deal with this before we go any further. Why, you may ask? Because I care for each and every single one of you here. And I have had conversations with you here. Some of you here who are in condemnation. You are in spiritual depression at times. And then just to have somebody say to you, you need to do better. Because completely against what Paul is preaching here. So I must deal with this, brothers and sisters. Please, bear with me. So we look into this. Let's go into this a little bit more. The idea of this being something of our righteous deeds should be easily, easily refuted, even by the grammar. Please just look at it for a moment. It doesn't say, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It says, having having put on the breastplate of righteousness. This is something past tense, not something which we must continue to do. I say if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this evening, the Christian already has the breastplate of righteousness on. But not only that, if we think for one moment that our righteous deeds somehow impress or repel the devil, we must be on another planet. You may be saying, what do I mean by that? What do I mean? Even though we, as Christians, as I said, endeavour to walk in good works out of love, out of love and obedience for Jesus Christ, Unfortunately, we must confess that even our most righteous deeds are tainted with sin. We must confess with the songwriter, the best of our works have pierced your hands and your feet. Some of you may have experienced this. You may be walking in obedience. You may be having a time of such great sanctification and you see that sin is being put to death. You see that you're evangelizing as you should. You see that you're in prayer as you should. Then the devil will suddenly come and turn himself into an angel of light and whisper in your ear, look how good you're doing. Look how good you're doing. You're doing so well. You should be so proud of yourself. Look at the man over there. Look at, look at him who's struggling. Look at him in the congregation who's broken for his sin. It's not you anymore. Look how well you're, you're doing. Suddenly we become proud and pride takes place in our heart. And again, our works, even though they are good, are tainted with sin. Charles Spurgeon, in one of his sermons, commented on a certain account from John Bunyan's life. I quote, this is Spurgeon who speaks. Someone once told John Bunyan that he had preached a delightful sermon. This was John Bunyan's response. You're too late, he says. You're too late. The devil told me that before I left the pulpit. Satan is adapt and equipped in teaching us how to steal our master's glory. End quote. What was John Bunyan doing? Was he walking in obedience? But yet the devil came to him and tried to puff him up 
Why am I bringing this to you? Because our best of works are fortunately, brethren, even though through Christ's imputed righteousness, we impart that righteousness, because we're in this body of sin and of flesh, they're still tainted, brothers and sisters. You know in your own heart. I don't need to go any further. We know. We know. The devil won't always come and depress us. He is right there, is he not, to puff us up with pride as pride comes before a fall. It doesn't matter how good we are, unfortunately, as I said, the best of our works have sin attached to them. So how on earth are our righteous deeds to act as a breastplate? We need a breastplate that, if you like, is bulletproof. We need a breastplate that is impenetrable, that has no cracks. If it depends on you and I, oh, how the cracks shall be formed and our vital organs exposed. Some in the congregation may be saying, well, Nick, I know I'm not perfect, but my deeds are good. They're good. I live the best life I can. Surely it must count towards something of this breastplate that, that, that Paul is talking about. Paul's, the Apostle Paul says this. Not literally, but this is what he says. You want to play that game? Let's take a look at my resume, shall we? Do you have your Bibles? Please turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 to 8. Paul says, you want to put yourself up against standard of someone who's living a righteous life? Let's check out my resume. Let's check out my CV and, still what's on, and see what's on there. I read, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Then he says this, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm also circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Listen to this concerning righteousness which is in the law blameless listen to that language blameless but what things were gained to me these things I have counted lost for Christ yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of knowing of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul says, no confidence in the flesh. He says, look at my life concerning the righteousness which is from the law, blameless. Even that, I say, is counted as rubbish. And the New King James does not do that word rubbish justice. The word is scubula. It means dung. It means something that we see on the floor. It's a vile word, actually. But Paul uses that to describe his own righteousness concerning the law. I count it as dung. I say this in reverence, brothers and sisters. Those men who have come to the conclusion that this breastplate is our righteous deeds... Have no idea. I have no idea how they came up with that conclusion. So what is Paul saying then? What is Paul saying? What is the breastplate of righteousness that we need? Paul gives us the answer in the same chapter in Philippians uh, verse three, uh, sorry, chapter 3 verses 8 to 9. He says this, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Listen, brothers and sisters. Listen, brothers and sisters. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from who? From God. From God, which is by faith. 
This breastplate, this breastplate of righteousness is none other than the most glorious, most blessed, most wonderful righteousness of Jesus Christ that is imputed to every believer who calls upon his name. Our wedding garment that he clothes us with at conversion is also our breastplate against the attacks of the wicked one. This is why we must be absolutely convinced about the doctrine of justification by faith alone. We must be convinced by it. It is the only way in which we can walk with peace and confidence in our Christian life. The doctrine of justification by faith alone is, if you want to say, the devil buster. I will, in my next point, look at how this breastplate is applied. But please just give me a few moments while I briefly look at this most glorious truth that we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. And this is where, my brothers and sisters, we should start to see the parts of this armour coming together. So when we gird ourselves with truth, we don't just look at doctrine per se. We must, as individuals, work out our doctrine so that we may apply these truths and these benefits to our own life. If the belt of truth is the starting point, the foundation of general truth, the general truth of scripture, the breastplate of righteousness is the foundation of our standing before a thrice holy God. The understanding and the possession of this righteousness is essential to our pilgrimage throughout this land and the battle against the principalities. Now, I'm sure the vast majority of you here have heard of the doctrine of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But if there is any here who do not know, let me first for a moment just work this doctrine out for you. So you may understand this most glorious truth of this breastplate. So very briefly, we must understand that you and I as individuals have ruined ourselves in sin. Not only did we inherit Adam's sin, original sin, but we have broken the righteous, holy commandments of Almighty God. And God's standard for us to be righteous in His sight is complete perfection, complete sinlessness, and to be positively righteous in His sight. Meaning that you and I, so we can be in God's presence, must have obeyed from the heart all of what the law and its demands lay down. And this is why the notion that we can be justified by any sort of work is absurd. God's standard is moral perfection and you and I are not. However, in his mercy, in his goodness, because God is good, he sent forth his son, Jesus of Nazareth, born in the likeness of sinful, sinful flesh, born under the law. And for 33 years is Jesus. He fulfilled every jot and tittle of the Ten Commandments, of the entirety of the law laid down in his active obedience. Jesus fulfilled every aspect of the law of God. He obeyed the law, not just to prove how good he is, for he is God. He is altogether good. He needs not prove anything, but he did this on behalf of sinners like you and I here this evening. Jesus lived for us before he died for us. Then upon Calvary's tree, he took every single sin that a believer would ever commit. He took the whole sin debt of a believer and it was imputed to him. And he bore the punishment and died in our place and on the third day rose again victoriously for our justification. Then we who are sinners, who are only worthy of condemnation and hell, Receive the most wonderful benefit of this work. Theologians call this the great exchange. Christ took our sin. Christ took our guilt. And we who are unworthy 
received the most blessed gift of his perfect righteousness. Isn't that wonderful, brothers and sisters? Not one of our sins remains. Our lives, if we are in Christ, are forever hid in Christ, in God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Therefore we who are Christ are forever justified. And when God sees us, he sees the righteousness of Christ upon him. Not one sin will ever cause a break in this breastplate. It is a complete, finished work. And this righteousness is received by faith alone. We must confess with the hymn writer, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in your righteousness? No, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. This is why this breastplate is essential. It's the foundation of our standing before God. Do we see that, brothers and sisters? Do we see how essential this breastplate is? It is the foundation of our entrance. It's our access. It is everything that we need to stand faultless before him. So some of you, some of you in the uh, congregation may be saying, Okay, that's well and good, Nick. But how is this related to our fight against the principalities and powers? You say, yes, I see how it's relevant for salvation. Granted, that's, I see that. But how does this become something to be applied in this great battle? Which leads me to the application and my heading. If you're taking notes, the next heading is this. Breastplate applied. Breastplate applied. Now we've seen clearly that this breastplate of righteousness, what it is, as I said, we must ask the question, for the benefit of us as individuals, how is this to be applied in this great fight against our ancient foe who seeks to work us woe? You see, the problem today, brothers and sisters, many of us know about doctrine intellectually. But what we lack is how these are applied and lived out. The devil, you know, is quite happy about you and I knowing about the doctrine of justification by faith. He's quite happy about you and I knowing about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yet if not lived out... We cannot use this as a weapon against him. Just like what Paul is giving us here. He's not just giving us doctrine. It is doctrine. Yet if it's not lived out, it's useless. So faith without works is dead. So how can we apply this as individuals, this breastplate? Remember, brothers and sisters, the picture that Paul is giving us. He is stating that this particular piece of armour protects the soldier from all his vital organs to be exposed. So likewise, spiritually, we must understand this piece of armour to protect our conscience, our feelings... And our emotions, which the great enemy of our soul would have in complete disarray. So we are paralyzed of walking this Christian life with joy. Brothers and sisters, we often underestimate how our feelings have an effect on the rest of the whole person. So the devil is forever, forever after distressing us. So we shall be downcast and be in constant despair and useless for the kingdom of God. Now at this point, let me address this, brothers and sisters. If there are any here who say, well, I'm just a little Christian in the corner. I have nothing to offer, I, I'm not a preacher or an evangelist, I can't even make a decent cup of tea when asked. Surely it doesn't really matter if I'm downcast and you, because I'm useless. I say with the authority of scripture and I say, 
you have already succumbed to the activity of the wicked one. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're bedridden, blind with no limbs. You have, by the grace of God, just as much as a part of building the city of God than you do the street preacher or the evangelist or the ones who are going to Nepal. The revival in the Hebrides, Ryan mentioned it, was a result of two old women... And I believe one of them was blind in one eye, praying prayers of intercession that God would rend the heavens and revive his work. We must as individuals completely reject the notion, well, I'm just that little Christian, it doesn't really matter if I'm downcast. Must be rejected. We need to remember our breastplate and this is where we shall revisit one of the schemes or wiles of the devil the devil if you remember is famously called who the accuser of the brethren the accuser of the brethren he is constantly bringing accusation to us he accuses us before God and accuses us before our own consciences and this happens to be one of the most common ways in which he comes to bring saints into ruin and one of the most common ways he comes accusing us is when we come to God in prayer how often, brothers and sisters, will you be in prayer and suddenly, when you want to be in the very presence of God, the thoughts of your past life are just thrown right into the midst of you? Or maybe you, you, you feel because you have sinned in such a certain way that you no longer have access to go to God in prayer. Brothers, sisters, if you're in Christ, you know what I'm talking about. It's very common activity of the wicked one. And then the devil will just tell you how vile, weak, wretched you are. He will say, how can you, who are so full of sin, enter into the very presence of this thrice holy God? You can pray all he like, he says. Then he might even bring a little bit of scripture for you, just so he can back up his point. He may say, remember John 9, 31? Now we know that God does not hear sinners. There you go. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. What use is praying to the Almighty God for revival? What use in praying for your lost family member? What use in praying so you may be strengthened? It's all useless. There's no way he'll ever answer you. What must we do, brothers and sisters? We must remember the breastplate of righteousness. Even though we are vile and, yes, full of sin, what do we have? We have a new and living way with this righteousness on. We take him back to scripture. What saith the word of God? Hebrews 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest of holies by what? Your own righteousness? No. By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he consecrates through the veil. That is, he his flesh. And having a high priest that is over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. With this righteousness on brothers and sisters, we, even though our consciences condemn us, even though the devil says you have no right to go, with this righteousness on we may enter through the veil and we may approach our Father in heaven. But the devil may come back and say, ah, well that's well and good, but, but, always look for the but. Whenever there is a questioning of God's word, it is a very good indicator that the devil is at hand. He may just suggest to you, well, your particular sin is different to everyone else's who is in the congregation. It somehow puts you in a separate category and therefore that's true of them. But of you, it's kind of like, you know, you've got no access because that one puts you out of the fold of God. Jesus will not be compassionate to you. What do you do in that situation? 
Again, you remember your breastplate and you remember what say of scripture. You see what you're doing? You're girding yourself with truth and you have your breastplate on. You see what's happening, brothers and sisters? And you remind him, Hebrews 4, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Brothers and sisters, it does not matter the sin of the past. The word of God tells us that we have a high priest who is on a throne of grace. It's a throne of grace. And thanks be to God, where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. Brothers and sisters, I don't care if you are guilty of murder and of the single vile sin that this world can throw at you and that you are guilty of. If you are in Christ, you are as justified as a little church goer who wouldn't say booth to a goose. You are justified by the blood of the Lamb. I say, if there's any here who are troubled about going to God in prayer because of your unworthiness, again, I say, remember your breastplate. You have every right to go to your Father in prayer. Why? Because in the Father's eyes, you are perfect. Not because you in yourself are perfect, but he sees the righteousness of his blessed son. So when you go to God in prayer, have this in mind. Zephaniah 3.17 He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love and he shall rejoice over you with singing. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. With his righteousness on we may rejoice. As the father delights to be in communion with his children. Praise God. Praise God. And lastly before I finish. This breastplate also protects us. When we in this life fall into sin post conversion after we have been converted this breastplate protects us post conversion when we fall into sin you see the devil won't just bring up the sins committed in the past he is always waiting he's always ready christian listen he's always waiting he's always ready for you to take that fall Especially after conversion. And remember what one of his names are. The devil is the tempter. Yes, we have a sinful nature. The devil's not in control of all of our sinning. But he is the tempter. And he will come and arouse those ungodly passions. And he will come and arouse all those things that the old man loved. And suddenly when you fall, the tempter becomes your accuser. You see... What we must again realise is the doctrine of justification of faith alone and recognise the power of this breastplate. This, this scheme, this is what I'm talking about lastly, seems to be the one that brings most Christians into absolute despair. When we sin, he will come straight away and batter your conscience. You know what I'm talking about if you're in Christ. If, you don't, if you're not in Christ, you won't have a single clue what I'm talking about. But you will fall into sin and then your conscience will be battered with the accusations of the devil. What does he say to you? Firstly, he'll say, you can't go back to God straight away. You can't go back to God now because you've sinned. He doesn't just give forgiveness out like he's giving out sweets. You can't go back to him straight away. Then he will come and say, look, listen. You sinned in your past life because you didn't know Christ. But now you've sinned when you know Christ. Oh, now you've sinned against love. You've sinned against light now. 
There's no way he shall accept you back. Remember what it says in Hebrews 6? It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gifts and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good words of the powers and the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. You've fallen away, you've sinned. The whole thing is useless now. You're as damned as Judas Iscariot. What's the answer to this kind of accusation? It's not arguing with the devil. You can't argue with the devil. Do you know that? He knows you better than you know yourself. And he's got a long list of your motives and your sins. He knows what you are like. They've been around a long time and they have studied humans a lot longer than we have. There's no point arguing with the devil. What do we do? We remember this beautiful, glorious righteousness of Jesus Christ that God has clothed us with by faith in his Son. And I know there may be some of you who will accuse me of antinomianism, but I say the scriptures are true. Christ did not just die for your past sins. He died for every sin you could commit. Past, present, future. The one you'll commit tomorrow, paid. When God justifies, he does not do it and then he has to redo it. It is an absolute nonsense that we can be justified one moment, unjustified, justified, unjustified. This is a once and forever declaration from Almighty God. As the hammer goes down, justified, once and forever. So how do we deal with him? Oh friends, if you're in Christ, this will not lead you to carry on sinning. This will cause you to be free and want to serve him with all your heart, mind and soul. We go back to the devil and say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My little children, I write these things that you may not sin, but if any man does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not just our sins, but the sins of the whole world. The moment you go back to God with a contrite heart, the moment you go back to him and acknowledge your sin before him, he washes you clean. The sin has already been paid for. Listen to me now, brothers and sisters. The sin has already been paid for. We do not go to be re-justified. Or we go to have our relationship restored with him. This relationship, this one that God has done, can never be broken. We who are once children of God will always be children of God. When my children are disobedient to me, yes, they will be chastised. Yes, they will have a telling off. But my son and daughter never stop being my son and daughter. They may have been disobedient, but at no point did they ever stop being my children. Therefore, when we sin, the relationship is never, ever, ever in any jeopardy. For he has sealed you by his spirit and the robe of his son clothes you once and forever. So it does not matter what the devil will try and do and terrify us with the terrors of the laws and it demands. It comes back to this breastplate which we have seen and we say with Augustus top lady, the terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing do. Why? My Saviour's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. We stand in the righteousness that he by his son has purchased for you and I. We must stand on this. If we do not stand on the doctrine of justification by faith alone to receive this righteousness, you will be in peril in your Christian life. For one moment when you're well, you will be like, I'm doing well. But then as soon as you fall, you'll be in absolute disarray. For you shall be on sinking ground. Stand on the rock of Christ. 
Stand on justification by faith alone. Stand on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Don't argue with him. Remind yourself of what Christ has done for sinners such as you and I. And we can declare from the house of brethren, listen, you who are in Christ, we may declare today, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? For it is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Furthermore, is risen and is at the right hand of God who will make constant intercession for us. I finish. I finish with two final comments. I speak firstly to you in the congregation who have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are here today, and you are living in constant condemnation from your past or your failure, I want to speak peace over you. Speak peace over you. That your sins are gone. You are free. Free to sin, no. Free to serve him. Free to love him. But remember also, the righteous man may fall seven times, but he rises again live boldly for your saviour for your salvation is secure your salvation is forever and nothing can thwart the almighty plan of God not even not anything and definitely not the devil and definitely not us as Richard Sibb says there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us and lastly there may be some of you here who have not yet come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ who have not yet bowed the knee. I want to say this to you, and I will be very brief because I know time is ticking on. You don't have a breastplate on. You don't have a righteousness that is impenetrable. And it says in the Bible, it is appointed for men to die once and then judgment shall come. If you are not in Christ, I don't care how much you give to charity. I don't care how good you are to your family. I don't care if you've done so many good deeds. If you do not have Christ, you will perish and go to hell. I don't care how harsh that sounds, and I know it's not the narrative of the day which it says you can be what you want to be, but I say to you there is no other name under heaven than man at which they shall be saved. It is the name of Jesus Christ. And I call you today, if you have not believed and trusted upon this Jesus, do not wait for tomorrow, for you may have an aneurysm and die. Come to him now, in repentance. What does that mean? We heard it this morning. Change your mind about who you are. Change your mind about sin. Change your mind about Christ. And come. And do you know what Christ has ready for you? He has this robe. And it's there. And it's to be received by faith in him. Come to him. He's ready. He's willing. He's able. Come to him. Do not delay. Come now. Be reconciled. Be reconciled to God who loved you and gave himself for you. And then you may have this attire, this battle garment ready that shall never ever be penetrated by any fiery dart of the wicked one. And you may stand and knowing that when you die, you shall enter that celestial city. Wrath will pass if you come to Christ. Come to him now. Amen. Amen.